In today's video, I'm going to take a look at the Audro EP8 head cam. And if you can't already guess, it's this thing on the side of my head here. It's a 4K60 camera with built-in stabilisation. And I do already own the previous model in this range. That's the Audro EP7. And in fact, that's the camera that you're looking through at the moment. So in this video, I'll be able to do a comparison between the two. Let's get on with it. The camera comes supplied in a nice hard carry case, but it's likely you'll never use that again after taking the camera out because it only fits in here once it's disassembled. In the case, you get the camera, a headband, a cleaning cloth, instructions, micro SD to USB adapter, USB lead, and a Bluetooth remote control. The camera comes in black or silver. I chose the latter. The headband is mounted to the camera via a standard tripod screw mount. And the sound also comes out via this section. More on that in a moment. It accepts a micro SD card up to 256 gigabytes and the USB port is a USB-C which is used for power slash charging and data transfer and if you want you can also use this camera as a webcam. And finally there's a micro HDMI output on the back as well. Now the first thing you'll want to do is assemble the headband and attach the camera to it. In a bag you'll find a couple of plastic clips that can be used for routing a wire around the headband and this is for if you wanted to power the camera for a longer period of time than the internal battery could accommodate you could run a USB-C wire from the camera around the headband down the back of your neck and into a USB power bank and then you could record all day long probably longer because the camera can record and be powered at the same time. Now once the camera's on the mount you cover that part up with a rubber earpiece and that's where the sound comes through. I'm going to play you some of the audible cues that the camera will play into your ear. Please hold on the photo button to format the memory card. Format completed. Wi-Fi on. Wi-Fi off. Taking a picture. Start recording. Stop recording. Now I should mention that headband is adjustable and I've got a massive skull and it fits me just fine with room to spare. The little remote control, I found that surplus to requirements. It's easy enough and more responsive just to press the buttons on the camera itself. And it's also slightly odd that this remote charges via micro USB when the only cable in the box is a USB-C. The remote can either be used on a pendant mount or attached to a wristband. And with that covered, let's have a look at some of the footage that I've shot with this camera. Time to mention the app. It's available for iOS or Android, and I'm sure you're familiar with these things now. Via Wi Fi, it allows control of the camera, provides a live viewfinder, facilitates transfer of clips to your smartphone, and enables adjustment of all the settings. Now, I've had no issues using it, although there are a couple of translation errors. For example, when first turned on, it says connecting device, which might make you think it was doing something. In reality, it should say connect device. It's a button that you need to press to activate the connection. As you can see, though, the live viewfinder has very little lag and all the options in the menus are clearly labeled and simple to adjust. I'll show you through some of the options now, the photo resolutions there, and in a second I'll show you the video. The video ones are all multiples of 30, so it goes up to 4K 60, we can do 720p 120, and pretty much anything normal in between those two. If you want to look at them in more detail, just press pause. You might have noticed there that you could shoot time-lapse. That's available as either time-lapse photos or time-lapse video. I wouldn't bother with either. Time-lapse video is really more effective when the camera's movements are gradual. 
therefore a head mounted camera is not the ideal location to be shooting time lapse from. In fact, I'll show you a clip now that I've recorded in the time lapse mode with the interval set at one frame per second. Oh, and by the way, you can see the date and time stamp at the bottom right there. That's something you can switch the date and time on or just the date or switch it off entirely. Anyway, let's have some more clips shot on location. Now you'll have noticed in quite a few of these shots, I've got my spectacles in the corner of the frame. I mean, I don't know if they're there now. That's one of the things, of course, I'm not looking at a viewfinder, so I'm not exactly sure where the camera's pointing. Now I could get my phone out of my pocket and look at the live viewfinder and then make some corrections, but just for the moment, let me just take my specs off so that then you've got a nice clear image. Now you can tell roughly which way the camera's pointing just by putting your hand up to the side of your head and you can feel whether or not it's uh, pointing down or up, but I think this is about right. This seems to be about eye level. So what I want you to do now is just have a look at the image stabilization that's going on here. It's a rough road, I'm just walking along it at a normal speed. Not trying to be particularly careful, just see how it copes with this. And then we'll try it with the EP7. Now another thing to mention about the EP8, I noticed in the software there's a tick box to uh, sort out the distortion, distortion correction, to stop the, the fisheye effect at the edges. Now when I put the EP7 into the app, that option wasn't there. Now I don't know whether it means it does it automatically and you can't switch it off, or it's not there. So look out for that as well, just see if the EP7 looks kind of distorted at the edges. So I think we've got a rough idea of the EP8 here, let's just swap over. Okay, so now we're looking through the EP7, so pay attention to both the stabilisation and the distortion if it's there. The only thing that I've noticed that's a slight benefit to the EP7, and it isn't really worth choosing EP7 for this, but it's just it's a tiny bit lighter than the EP8. But in every other regard, the EP8 is definitely the one to go for. Everything about this is better than the previous one. The main thing with this is the EP7. You might have noticed the 90 degree field of view. Now, that was a reduction over the EP6, which I've tested. That was 130 degrees. The EP7 went down to 90 degrees, yet it was stabilized and it was 4K60. And then this time with the EP8, they managed to get that both stabilized and 4K60, but back to 130 degrees again. And that really is important because with head cams, you do a lot of kind of looking at stuff. I mean, you can't help it. Your head's just moving around all the time. And with a narrow field of view, that's really quite distracting. It makes you feel a bit seasick. You know, somebody says, oh, what's that over there? What's that over there? You see what I mean? It just does your head in. But let's just go back to the EPA and I'll do a bit of a bit of a head pan with that. Oh, what's over there? Not a lot, but a field, but and that way. See what I mean? Just with a bit more field of view. I know it's not pleasant still. I mean, you don't really want someone doing this all the time. But it's a lot better than doing it in 90 degrees. Uh, one thing I want to mention, the uh, EP8, there is an option that you can have it uh, shoot vertical video. You have to go into the app and make it like 9 by 16 that way. Um, if I ever do something like that, uh, ring the ambulance to take me away. Because what's the point of having a head cam with all this, all this scenery around me? And then you just shoot like this little lane in the middle. Yeah. Um, no, I won't be shooting vertical video, but if you wanted to, because you want to make a TikTok video or something, well, the EP8 is the one to get. The EP7 again didn't have that uh, feature. Now, I've just had to come back out of the house because I had a look at the clips I'd shot earlier on today when I was walking around, and there were some problems with the audio. First off, the intro that I originally shot, it was drowned out by wind noise, and it's only a light breeze that's around today, so I managed to find a more secluded spot so I could reshoot that intro, so that's what you've seen at the beginning. But yeah, the original one I shot, I couldn't use. But I'll also mention I also own the Audro EP7, and that's what you're looking through at the moment, so we can do a bit of a comparison between the two. So that's something to mention. Wind noise is a bit of a problem with this camera. The other one is that the audio is just way too boomy. Now there's nothing I could do about that because it's an auto gain, it's set in the software somewhere, I don't have any access to those controls. But it's something that wasn't a problem with the EP7. In fact, you're looking through the EP7 now and I'm sure you'd be quite happy with the audio quality. But if I was to show you this clip now through the EP8 that's on the side of my head, 
you'll see that the audio on this one is way too saturated, too boomy, there's too much gain in here. Now let's just swap these around and I want to show you that the EP7 is much better in this regard than the EP8. Okay, so now you're looking through and hearing the audio from the EP8, and at this distance it really isn't all that bad, there's no problems here at all. But the EP7, if we just swap over to that, with this on the side of my head, and you can see that while I'm talking through this one, we're not having that same oversaturated boomy effect that we are with the EP8. So I suggest they need to go back into the EP8 firmware and just twiddle the settings a little bit, uh, just turn that volume down a touch, because it really is just a little bit too high and it's um, oversaturated. The camera will record for as long as you need it to without stopping. It segments the video into the usual 4 gigabyte chunks and a 4 gigabyte file will contain approximately 15 minutes of 4K60 recording. You can also choose to make it operate more like a dash cam by activating the looped recording function. Now in this mode it splits the video into 3 minute clips and when the memory card is full it deletes the oldest 3 minute clip. Now I'll show you the join between two of these clips here and you can follow this along by looking at the progress bar at the bottom of the screen. The only thing you'll spot at the join is a click on the audio. While I'm sat here, just wanted to mention that you can see my speedo there. You can also see, I'm not talking about uh, swimming trunks, but you can see the speedometer. You can also see my hands. Now imagine I had some kind of accident and the third party said well you were messing around with your phone and i'll say no i wasn't messing around with the phone it's not even out it's in my pocket they go no i saw you messing around with your phone well you know here we go here's the evidence of what was going on at the time of the crash now there's one scenario in which i've used these head cameras quite a few times in the past and it's when i'm doing what i'm doing now which is driving a vehicle that isn't mine this is a hyundai ionic and it's not what i've stolen no this is a hire car and whether I'm driving a hire car or a courtesy car, of course it won't have a dash camera in it. Whereas my own vehicles do, and I always like to have a dash camera in my car. Now the ones that are fitted to my car, well they're stuck to it with adhesive pads, so I can't just swap one out and put it in one of these. So it's a lot easier for me just to bring along this head camera, and therefore I've got a dash camera wherever I go. And it's that aspect of the camera following you around, rather than it being attached to a particular vehicle, that would come in handy for a chap who got in touch with me not too long ago and he wanted to know what kind of camera to buy and his job was to deliver vehicles and he drove around a large HGV with a trailer on the back and stopped at various locations got out of the cab, reversed these vehicles off the back and then got back in and drove to the next place so for him he could have a camera attached to his head and it would record whatever vehicle it was he was driving at the time just a quick word about the indicator lights. The green LED shows that it's powered on. A flashing green LED shows that it's recording. A red LED shows that it's being charged slash powered via USB. And finally, there's a blue LED towards the left-hand side, which really doesn't show up well on this video, but in person you can see it clearly. That one flashes when the Wi-Fi has been turned on. Now, of course, all these lights can't be seen by a person who is wearing the camera. So it would be nice if that wrist remote also flashed to show the camera was recording, but it doesn't. It's not a two-way communication between the two. The only reason I mention this is that I thought I'd shot some scenes at one point for one of my Patreon update videos but I'd forgotten to press the record button and with no indicator visible to remind me that the camera wasn't recording I happily spoke away for 10 minutes with the camera completely switched off. The EP8 compared to the previous EP7 it's got a, a better night vision sensor the gimbal is gimbal 2.0 and the previous one was 1.0 so presumably better stabilization it mentions that you can shoot vertical video if you've lost your mind. It also goes on about it's got 130 degree wide angle lens, which we've covered as opposed to 90 on the previous one. Big one for me, 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. Uh, useful for transferring files across to your phone quickly as opposed to the previous one, which was 2.4 gigahertz. And just to give you an idea as to how long it takes to transfer files across, this is a 38 second long file recorded in 4K60 and in my test copying it to my phone took just under one minute. Now all the clips I've used in this video of course I've copied across to a computer and I've done that by taking the micro SD card out and sticking it in a USB reader, I'd rather do it that way. But if you're copying them to your phone, yeah it does it reasonably quickly. You'll just need a little bit of patience if you're copying loads of files. I just want to mention the battery life, not brilliant, we've got 
about 100 minutes on 4K or 2.7K video, so you know, 1 hour 40, 1080p, 170 minutes. I mean, I think that's plenty. Of course, this thing doesn't have a screen on the back of it, so that does help it, but it is quite small, so there isn't much room for a battery. But I think 1 hour 40 of 4K video at uh, 4K 60, I think that's plenty. Photo resolution, I'm not too fussed about the photos with this. I mean, it's unlikely you get this and then start taking photos with it. You don't exactly know where you're pointing. Here's a picture I took at that spot. This one is supposed to be a 14 megapixel image. You can choose to capture in up to 20 megapixels, but in all honesty, if you want to take a picture, use something else. This is really a device that's best suited for recording video. IPX4 is mentioned, but also IPX5 is mentioned. Now, IPX4 is resistant to water splashes from any direction. IPX5 can resist a sustained low pressure water spray. It doesn't really matter the difference between those two. I mean, basically, if you're out with this on and it starts raining, you're all right, but don't go swimming with it. A quick word about that micro HDMI output that we saw earlier. Once that's been hooked up to a display, it acts as a viewfinder only. It's not for the playback of clips. There are no menus, there's no on-screen display, just a viewfinder. Now, whilst we've got it set up this way, we can look at the minimum focal length. It's quoted as being 30 centimeters, but you can see here, it feels like it goes quite a bit closer than that without getting too blurry. Oh, and of course, as I'm demonstrating here, you can record whilst using the HDMI output. Okay, so the final thing I want to mention is the cost. Of course, I bought this. This isn't a sponsored video. And it cost me £245. Now, that's not a cheap camera, but I'm happy with the camera, so to me it's a fair price. But I never really like to go into prices too much in videos because when I make a video that's set in stone and yet this information isn't going to be accurate in say six months or a year's time. So you might find it cheaper than that and especially if they start selling it without the bundle, without the wrist remote and the micro SD card and stuff. If you can just get the camera on its own I think that's the way to go and if that saves you perhaps 30 quid or whatever it is then that's what I'd do. But uh, there you go, that's the Audro EP8. Hope you've enjoyed having a look at it and uh, having a little bit of a walk with me. Right now, before I go, I've just got one important thing to add. Uh, last night when I was watching television, the phone starts blowing up with emails and I look at them and it's people are asking me whether they've won a competition. Yeah, um, I didn't know what they're on about either. Well, it turns out that they'd responded to a comment in the YouTube comment section that appeared to be from me and it looked like this. Now, I've blacked out some of the numbers there so nobody tries to dial it, but I mean, why would you? But anyway, uh, yeah, obviously it's not from me. It's a scammer. I mean, why would I start putting in the comments that you'd won a competition that you'd never entered? And then I'd type a number on there in such a way as to try and get around the spam filter when it's under my own video and I could type whatever I wanted in that space. So no you haven't won a competition if you see something like that. It's just a scammer who wants your money. Yeah, if you're brand new to the internet this week, there are nefarious people out there that are trying to rip you off. But as you can see from this image, if I do respond on YouTube, well, my responses are quite clearly highlighted. The username has that black lozenge shape around it. Most importantly, there's the verified tick next to it as well. I mean, just the fact that somebody's calling themselves something and using an image that they might have grabbed from somewhere doesn't mean they're that person, obviously. I mean, I could put a picture of the Queen up, put my username as HRH the Queen, and I'm definitely not the Queen. Anybody could put anything in there. What you're looking for is that verified tick. That's the important thing. Now, while I've been talking to you here, there's probably been another 50 of these posted across the channel. I mean, I've got over 550 videos. There's 10,000 comments posted on them a month. I can't be looking at them all the time just to check what's going on. If I see these things, I'll delete them, certainly. But there has to be a bit of personal responsibility to avoid getting scammed here. So if you're the kind of person that you think might be susceptible to scams that you see in YouTube comments of people asking you to text a number or dial a number, and if you think that seems totally legitimate, I would suggest it's a good idea to stay away from the YouTube comments because maybe it's perhaps not the best place for you. And bear in mind, just one rule in life, nobody ever wins competitions that they haven't entered. Anyway, that really is it for the moment. As always, 
Thanks for watching.